Hey guys, it's Nurse Howie, and I wanted to tell you about my first COVID patient. So when I first checked in into the unit, uh, usually I arrive 15 minutes early, but for some odd reason, I just kind of forgot and I decided to get extra coffee so I arrived just in time to work and when you arrive just in time in your nursing unit then you don't have time to really gather to see where you're gonna go next and what patients you have you have to just kind of hit the ground running so hence the reason why I like to go in a little bit early well after the nursing meeting ended I immediately went to go sign up my name to tell everybody what time I want to have my lunch but before I could do that, I couldn't find my name on the list. And so I kept looking and then the charge nurse said, Hey, Howie. And I said, what? And she goes, Hey, you're not on the list. And I go, I know. Do you know where I'm at? Uh, am I supposed to be um, in this unit? And she goes, no, you're floating. And to nurses, floating means that you're going to go to a different unit, um, one that you don't usually work. So it, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, for some nurses, especially those that are um, not new to floating to another unit and you know they're a little bit wary of finding out where and how to take care of a patient. You know, it makes you kind of a little bit nervous because you're a little bit at a disadvantage. You're not in your home court. So she said, yeah, you're floating to, to um, the third floor. So I said, okay. And I knew what that meant. Um, the third floor meant that it was a COVID unit. Um, it was around mid-March and we stopped trying to limit um, COVID patients from staying in a particular floor based on another disease. Now we have changed an entire floor, an entire nursing unit to just have COVID patients. So I said, okay. And then I left. When I got there, I saw that there was a sign, <clears throat> a sign and the doors were closed. And then I saw that I re after I read the sign, it said that nurses weren't who weren't assigned to that unit weren't allowed there. So if you were a nurse or a staff member or a doctor who had no business being in that unit, stop and turn around now. And I thought, well, I have business in this unit. I'm assigned here tonight. I better go in. And then when I went in, I was a little bit pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of people were wearing masks. And they also had pappers, which were these powered, I think, um, powered uh, fan machines. And it had a battery pack attached to a plastic helmet with a face shield and a hood um, around the neck. And then the fan would bring out some air and it would just keep kind of blowing air in front of your face so that the draw of uh, the airborne particles of the virus wouldn't come up to your face and so i waited and to go in you know i talked to the charge nurse reported and told them that i was floating there and they said thanks for coming in here are your assignments and i had my assignments right in the middle of the unit i waited for the nurse shift report and but before that, I went to go see exactly what the culture of the unit was. Was everything being run in an organized fashion? Um, how were the attitudes of the nurses? Um, were there a lot of call bells ringing? Um, was there some arguments or fights? Or were people pretty much disciplined and civilized? Well, I found that people really kind of were disciplined and civilized. And I also saw that there was... Uh, boxes at the end of the units uh, where they asked people to drop their face masks, their used face mask and N95 masks and paper face shields and that they would recycle them and then um, bring them back for everybody to reuse after they've been sterilized. I'll probably talk about it in my next video but that was not the case. But I didn't know that at the time so I waited for the next I had the offgoing nurse to give me 
um, the report on their patients. And I had about three because it was a, uh, a very acute unit. And obviously we had a lot of patients who were not just COVID rule out, but they were also actually COVID positive. Uh, so everybody had their own room and um, you know they couldn't share with anybody else and you had to go in and out of each room donning your equipment and then taking it off in a routine fashion in a methodical method um, in and out of each room that you go into so I go in and um, I'm sorry, I don't go in. I'm waiting for the next nurse, and the nurse comes in, and she's kind of chipper. She's like, hey, how's it going? Um, I have your first patient. And I said, oh, great, thanks. And um, she gave me a, a report. Now, a nursing report is very important because, especially when I go to an unknown unit, I'm going to have unknown patients. And so I'd like to usually get a good history of, like, what brought the patient there? What active problems are we taking care of? What is the patient's primary problem? What's the patient's main complaint? Um, not just for when they were admitted in the hospital, but you know, all throughout the day. Um, so I can try to continue on trying to make the patient feel better. And also we talk about the patient's um, uh, review of systems. So we go from top down. We talk about the neurological status and then the cardiac status and the respiratory status. Can they breathe? What machines are they on? And then we talk about um, uh, GI to see if they're able to swallow pills or if we have to give them a certain fluid nutrition or some other kind of way to maintain their um, uh, their uh, oral intake or other way to, for them to ingest foods for energy. Um, and then we also check, talked about their genital urinary, urinary system to see if they're competent, continent or not. And um, sorry, I'm a little tired and uh, to see if they can even walk or get out of bed or if they're really unsafe and if we should you know watch them even closer and we watch everybody always closely but um, there's some people that just need a little bit more extra monitoring so we don't fall because falling is the worst thing you can one of the worst things you can do in the hospital because it keeps you there for like another week and there's additional paperwork and yada yada um, and then there's also um, the skin to see if there's anything broken are there any wounds that we need to take care of um, and then we talk about what medications the patient's taking what medications can they take when they're hurt you know all that stuff that's very important um, so when I got uh, my report on a couple of other patients um, the first history of one of the patients really caught my eye or caught my ear rather and she said your next patient came from New York and said, oh, and she said, he's a rule out COVID, oh, which means that we were able to take a swab of his nasopharynx and pharynx and be able, and we took it out to the lab for them to um, establish PCR, which is a retroactive PCR polymerase chain reaction that we use to detect whether or not somebody is actually COVID positive. But he was a rule out. We didn't know yet. It's still been a couple of days. I said, oh, talk to me about his symptoms. And she told me about some symptoms, but the ones that really caught my eye and that I was looking out for were the symptoms that were described in a lot of the research articles over on um, um, the literature resources that I use. Uh, COVID lit or lit COVID is one of my favorite ones, and I'll put a description there down below. And she mentioned that he had trouble breathing. He had coughing. He had a fever. And he had just come from New York, which was very important um, hit part of the history. And then she also talked about how he seemed to have a little bit more trouble breathing today, um, despite whatever medications we were giving him, which was Plaquenil, which is an anti-malaria medication, and uh, Zithromycin, which is um, supposed to be an antibiotic that would help. But obviously... Um, you know, there's mixed messages on that, and I can tell you for right now that it doesn't do much good. And then, you know, we, we after she left, um, I looked at his labs, and I saw that his lymphocytes were low, and his um, inflammatory markers in his blood were slightly elevated, but not too much. But um, the lymphocytes was really kind of 
alarming to me because that's one of the symptoms and signs that the scientists have seen uh, based on research papers from China and other countries in Spain and Italy um, that have been afflicted. And then I also looked at his chest x-ray and I saw that there was ground glass opacities on both lobes but mostly particularly to the right lower lobe and you know it just kind of it was very striking because my other two patients were also rule out COVID um, and then one I, th I think was actually positive after I left but the other two I don't know because I don't I can't really cat follow up on patients that I'm not taking care of nor do I want to because that's their privacy um, but I do like to know if they turn positive because I was exposed to them at one time and I don't know if there's any policy that lets us know whether or not that they're gonna let tell us if the hospital administration is gonna tell us whether or not we've been exposed but you know as a nurse you're supposed to pretend like even if the patient is not COVID positive confirmed you still have to treat them as if they were um, but that doesn't mean that you can't treat them with any kindness so I saw that his chest x-ray was just really filled with so much gunk and we call those infiltrates and it was almost opaque that you can't even see through usually a clear x-ray you can just see very clean black and white picture of ribs and the chest x-ray and the heart and uh, the diaphragm but it wasn't so much for this guy so my other patients had it too but what's striking about this guy was that he had no other surgeries and he had no other symptoms um, and he had no other uh, medical history so that was very concerning anyway so I got my things together and another nurse came up to me and said, hey, I'm going to teach you about the PAPR today. Are you going to be using it for your patients? I said, great. The more PPEs I have, the better. So tell me. And she discussed, um, she took me over to a metal, uh, metal cabinet and it had plastic helmets all lined up in a row, like eggs in a basket or eggs in an egg carton. And she showed me how to plug the battery in into the plastic helmet papper, put it over my head, and then fitted a face shield with a plastic hood down underneath my neck. And then she saw that, um, she showed me how to turn it on, and that if the green light in front of me was green, then that means it was okay, but if it was yellow, it was time to change the battery, but mine was green. And then we talked about the order of when to put on um, the PPE and usually it started off with washing your hands of course and donning your gown and then your mask and then your papper um, and then your gloves and then when you doff it it's in a different um, order so uh, I went to go after that uh, training I went to go make sure that I knew what I was doing and you know these were Patients were patients, and it needs to take care of in the same high quality that I have with every other patient that I try to take care of. Okay, so I just had a little bit of an extra moment where I'm like, this is it. This is the time that I'm going to be taking care of a patient with an unknown disease, with no cure, and very fragile treatment plans, and that I don't know won't work. And if I get exposed, that's not only the end of my career, it's probably the end of, I don't know. So it was a lot for me to think in, if you can imagine. So I went to every nurse's area of seclusion where you pump yourself up. And that's the bathroom. <laughs> so I went in there, looked myself straight in the eye, and I said, you signed up for this. But I also didn't deny that I was scared. You know, I knew that I needed to psych myself up and I knew that I needed to be able to bring the same care to any patient, regardless of what is afflicting them. So, um, you know, took a couple selfies and to commemorate the situation and kept that pump going. So I started to go down the line and I introduced myself to each patient uh, but before I went in, I just kind of slightly opened the door. Thank goodness I had a negative pressured room. So all the air 
in those that was in that room were being sucked in rather than out. So I was able to open the door slightly of the crack and I said, Hi, my name is Howie. I'm going to be your nurse tonight. And I wanted to ask to see if you're okay first and if you're in pain and if there's anything extra I can give you. The reason why I said that is because it takes a long time for me to go in and out of each room. And if the patient asks for another request, I have to re put on my gown and do everything in and out and all that stuff. So I like to make sure that I talk to them first. Usually I, I, I go one by one. I go first to the patient who's most in trouble. And I still do, but um, this time around I, I ask right away, say, is there anything I can get you before I come in? And he said, you know, and they just, nobody had any major requests. So I started to take care of the patient that was least stable. Um, and this was obviously not the youngest patient, the, the young patient with no health history. I had to take care of a couple of other people that had um, other comorbidities, you know, like whether they were taking, they were uh, succumbing to a different disease and then this COVID stuff just happened to come by and make everything worse. So I need to take care of them first. So that started to take a while because it was just, you can't hear through that mask really. I mean, there's a little bit of a fan noise and they've done a great job of decreasing that noise, but I can't really assess my patient or listen to him or her. And um, so I kind of have to go by resource, you know, like do what I can do while I'm there with what I have. And, but I still had to scan my medications because you, these are systems in place to make sure that you don't make a mistake. And I respect these systems because I respect my patients. But it is so clunky trying to find and look through a plastic shield while trying to listen to the patient and trying to communicate. It was just a mess. So it took a while. So by the time I went to my, patient, my young patient's room, I said, hey, thanks for waiting. Um, you know, let me start by getting you, you know, comfortable and let me get that pillow that you asked for. And he was like this. And oh man, nothing makes a nurse's job harder when, is when the patient's already mad at you. Um, now we're not a restaurant. Okay. Nurses are not, um, people that just serve you food. We give you medications, we serve you medication, yes, but we're the first people to check to make sure if there's anything wrong with you and we'll react first because we know you and we're always with you, okay? Um, a lot of my customer service came from working either the food industry or the retail industry um, and you really have to be able to connect with people. And so rapport and connection is important to me, but a patient's health is more important. If the patient's starting to crash, I'm not going to try to be your friend. I'm going to try to rescue you, you know, but during the first meeting, at least I need to be able to have some kind of connection with my patient. And right now I wasn't having it. And so I said, okay, well, again, my name is Howie and I'm going to give you your antibiotics and I'm going to give you your, your pills. And then we'll try to get you to, to be more comfortable so you can have a good night. Um, what I didn't tell him was that there was, there's a lot of computer problems once in a while. Now we have a great electronic health record system, but sometimes it doesn't really do the job because it's not the patient. And there's people that make the mistake of just looking at machines, but not looking at the patient and determining whether or not, um, you know, that is the actual patient's record. So I always check to make sure I know the patient's name and, and record number. So I asked him hi what's your name so i asked the patient hey what's your name can i have your full name when is your birthday do you know what name of the hospital is and do you know what year it is and do you have any allergies and you i asked these of every patient that i talked to because i want to make sure that what identification they have matches the identification in the computer and so he did not like that he did not like being asked that. And he was just like, what are you, why are you asking me this? Don't you see it in the computer? It's in the computer already. I just want to make sure, you, do you know who I am? What are you doing? And I was like, oh, okay, come on, man. And so I, I say, okay, let's go one by one. All right. 
The reason why I'm asking you these questions is because I want to make sure your name matches everything in the computer and that it's correct, okay? And then I want to make sure that I know if you have any new allergies or anything that might mess you up when I give you medications. And he goes, well, what medications am I having? You just said antibiotics. You didn't say what I'm having. And I said, okay, well, this is what you're getting. You're getting azithromycin. It's the same antibiotic that you got yesterday. Okay, see this plastic bag here? It's the same medication. And if you take a look at it, they're the same name. We give it to you at a certain interval throughout the day. And that kind of helped him um, deal with it a little bit better. But he was still mad, so I stopped talking, okay? And I kneeled down and I listened to what he had to say. And I'm glad that I did that. And then, you know, the other nurse, the nurse aides took, you know, came in and saw that what I was doing and they kind of let me do, you know, backed off and let me try to make sure that I got a rapport with the patient because it's really important. And sometimes they get mistaken for being the nurses as well. So, you know, like they lash, you know, patients lash out at them when they shouldn't. They should lash out at me so I can determine what the problem is. Anyway, so after that, I said, I took, I let him finish and then I took a look at him and I said, hey, you're important to me, okay? But I have other patients and whoever patient has the worst time right now, I have to go and take care of first. Okay. You're doing well right now, but other people, not so much. And if a patient can't breathe, I have to go to them first. It's not that I'm trying to avoid you or that I forgot about you, but it's important that I take care of whoever's hurting the most. Do you understand? And you know, that started to calm him down a little bit. But he was still was in a bad mood. <laughs> so um, I go in and out and then um, usually, I mean, he just seems like he's doing well. You know, he's very stable. His vital signs are great. Um, and he's just very bored. You know, the sad thing is, is you can't have any visitors when you're a COVID patient, whether or not you're confirmed or not. You can't have any visitors ever, really, in the hospital right now. I mean, maybe you can have, you can give birth with a visitor and you can have two at a labor and delivery, but only one person can stay and they can't stay to watch you give birth. They have to wait until you come back to the room. And then when you die, you can't have a visitor either. It's very sad. We have, because they have to cremate the body. Ah, this is a world we live in now. But moving on, so the patient said that he uh, he's like, oh, I, I need to go to the bathroom. I need, can, can you unhook me, please? Can you let me go to the bathroom? You know, even if patient looks like he's stable, we always take fall precautions, and I take those seriously. So I made sure that everything was safe, the bathroom was open, um, and it was secure, and that I un started to unhook um, his lines. Uh, he's got... Um, air coming through his nose, he's got fluids coming into his body, he's got um, um, uh, he's got stockings and um, contraptions on his legs and I unhook those stuff because I know I, s I see that he's very strong and that he's he's stable but I'm still gonna stay in the room because I don't want him to fall or if he gets hurt um, I'll be there to take care of him right away. So I, I took everything off except for the the oxygen um, oxygen tubing and the nasal cannula. I waited until the very last second to do that because I wanted to see how he would do. And let me tell you, this defined what it was like taking care of a COVID patient for me. This young man who was at the prime of his life just happened to be visiting New York, came back was in our hospital and is now under my care. Had no prior medical history, no surgical history. The second that I unhooked that nasal cannula, the second that I took out that oxygen supplement to his body was when he kept coughing so much. It was like <coughs> 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 the whole time. 
Luckily, he only had to pee, so he was in the bathroom very long. Nor did it let him lock the bathroom, but I could hear, even through my face shield, even through my plastic helmet, through that sound whirring, whirring inside my face shield, and the TV on, and people outside making noises, I could hear him through the closed door, coughing incessantly. Incessantly, like he couldn't stop. It made me tired just listening to him. Finally, a couple of minutes went by, and I almost went in there to go get him, but he was able to get out. And I saw in his face a little bit of fear. And you know, a lot of the pain and a lot of the, the, the anger, the mental anguish comes from fear. And that's where we got our rapport. Of course, that happened in only a split second. I immediately put him back on the oxygen, made him comfortable back in bed, and hooked him back up to everything. Um, but that's when I understood. This is COVID. Now, he's not confirmed, but everything and all signs pointed to him being confirmed. And last I heard, he was still in the hospital. But I don't look up his record um, in order to respect his privacy. But that was my first exposure to a COVID patient. I would take care of more COVID positive patients after him. And then one of the other patients turned positive anyway. So I have been already exposed to COVID, but he was the one that made it real for me. This COVID rule out patient. <sighs> and you know that azithromycin wasn't working. It didn't look like it was working. We had been giving it to him for four days. And then the Plaquenil, which is the malaria medication, we've been giving that to. Boy, I heard it tastes really bad. Very bad. Even in any form. Liquid, tablet, um, powder. It just tastes bad. I don't know why we give it. And it's April now, early April, and I think we're running out. Doesn't matter, it doesn't work anyway. So, at the end of the shift, things turned out pretty pretty okay, and I finished my 12 hours. Um, before I could give my uh, report, though, to the next nurse coming after me, um, uh, somebody had sat down on my chair and I said, Oh, good, perfect, you're my next RN that I'm going to give a report to. Um, I had set up everything for you, the computer's ready, and I have your papers here, and um, it'll describe all the profiles of, of your patients that you're getting from me. And she goes, oh, I'm not a nurse. I said, oh, well, can you give me my seat back? You know, I have to report to the next nurse. And the nurse that I was actually supposed to be reporting to was standing right next to me. She's like, what's going on? And the person wouldn't leave. I mean, it was a, a, a healthcare worker, but um, it was a uh, nursing assistant. And I respect all my nursing assistants and LVNs and RTs and everybody, you know. Um, nursing assistants are crucial to nursing, okay? I would break my back in a year if I didn't have nursing assistants. They take care of lots of special things like cleaning the patient and cleaning the room and stuff. But I needed to give my report. And this nurse kept trying to take over my computer. I said, you know what? You can't take over the computer, please. I'm asking you. There's an open one right there. I know you're probably new here and you're floating here too, but you, I need to give this report. It's of the utmost importance. She goes, fine. And then she took off. She stole my chair. <laughs> so that was funny. But a little bit kind of, it gave me a little bit of a reminder that there's certain personalities that you still have to work with in this industry, in the healthcare field, anywhere really. And then you have to watch out for your hero complex because she's having a very puffed, puffed esteem, like a puffed sense of self, you know? And I wonder if I was having that too. But that's my story of my first COVID patient. I hope there won't be two more of these. Nurse Howie out. Like and subscribe. Talk to you guys later. Stay safe. Bye-bye.